Truth Espresso, episode 119. Face it, we all would rather sleep in this morning. <sighs> That's why God gave us espresso to kickstart our zombified corpses into hyperdrive. <laughs> And now, giving your mind and soul the morning shot of truth it craves. This is Truth Espresso with Daniel Minnick. Well, hello there. My name is Daniel Minnick, and welcome to this episode of Truth Espresso. My wife, my uh, co-host, is back with me to talk about some of the latest news here. And it seems like this month and last month, the news just keeps on getting newsier, (laughs) something (laughs) like that. And (laughs) so we have uh, kind of, a, I think, a short episode here, briefly going over three hot-button news items. And so, sweetheart, Chelsea, welcome back to Truth Espresso to host with me again. <laughs> Thanks, babe. So, the FDA is in the news again, and we did talk about the FDA a little bit with the abortion pill in the last two episodes that we were uh, hosting together. But the FDA shows up in the news again, and this time we think it might be a little bit on the positive side, but not for the media spin. You know, when it comes to the way things are handled in the media, things like this, they're kind of like, want to be up in arms about it because things are not as orderly as they would like them to be but i think this shows a little bit of a silver lining in things and what's going on with the fda well there has been described something of a potential mutiny happening within the ranks of the fda And this article by a Phil Shiver on September 1st, the first day of this month, is entitled Top Vaccine Officials Leave FDA Amid Infighting Political Pressure. Now there are warnings of a mutiny. And that's the title of an article from The Blaze. And it's talking about uh, these two FDA officials who are leaving and Sweetheart, do you want to talk about a little bit about why why were they leaving and who are they? Sure. So the top two leaders here at the FDA, uh, Dr. Marion Gruber, she was the director of the FDA's Office of Vaccines Research and Review, and her deputy, um, Dr. Philip Krauss, they announced this last Tuesday that they plan to retire in November. And this is according to an article by the MSNBC news site, also on September 1st. So basically, these two leaders in the FDA were feeling a lot of pressure from higher ups to try and get the booster vaccine out for COVID-19 with a deadline of September 20th. So they needed to have this out and available to the public by September 20th. And this was without any testing or approval from the FDA. And these two leaders who have been with the FDA for over 32 years and have been a huge part in a lot of different vaccines with um, Ebola, Zika, they helped out with the COVID-19. So they've been doing this for a long time. They are well versed in the side of things and they felt uncomfortable pushing this vaccine, especially without it being fully tested to have this third shot for the Pfizer to have this booster. So they ended up leaving and resigning. I know it's kind of hard sometimes to weed through all the different news articles to figure out exactly what's going on, but it did seem like there was some pressure also on getting the vaccine approved for children under 12 years old, and I was reading that that was part of this debate as well. Like, they didn't feel comfortable trying to give the vaccine to the younger population as well. (laughs) Yeah, wow. It's hard to uh, think about that without thinking about 
politics. You know, it seems like there's so much politics involved when it comes to things like that with the vaccines, uh, Pfizer, you know, getting the FDA to prove that. And, you know, I'm not very much a fan of the FDA at all. I'm not very much a fan of really any agency in the federal government. But, you know, sometimes you have things like this happen where I do want to applaud some people for actually having a backbone. And it seems like Dr. Marion Gruber and Dr. Philip Krauss actually, you know, they want things to be done orderly and with sufficient go through the process no matter how long it takes make sure things are safe to be approved and not cave into political pressure to impose this very short deadline because the biden administration just wants to rush things along for political gain to make sure that, okay, we've got to somehow legislate away the COVID virus, you know, (laughs) and we could do that by putting the pressure on the FDA to just rubber stamp things like this. And, you know, okay, so there's all this push for these vaccines. And then we find out, okay, they're not the panacea that we thought they were. And they don't cure COVID. They could even spread it because there's plenty of sources that I've read that would say that you have more of the COVID in your nostrils uh, you know when you're vaccinated and you know vaccinated people could technically become a super spreader they just don't experience the symptoms as strongly that's at least according to uh, some sources but (laughs) the vaccines don't end the pandemic they don't destroy covid you still get it you still spread it you just might not experience it as much but then okay you know (laughs) it doesn't really cure it and it's about 30 percent possible effective so okay you can't just need one shot you need two shots okay now you need three shots and yeah third time's a charm here and so okay you know the two shots a lot of people are getting we're getting close to a herd immunity in many states with these vaccines moderna and pfizer are seem to be the two now most popular ones And that's still not enough, so maybe we need a third shot, these so-called booster shots, and and we want to make sure everyone takes those, and hey, FDA, let's rubber stamp this you know we got to make sure that the president looks good and um, but the silver lining as i said is that these two people from the fda don't want to have their hand forced by a political administration here that don't know as have as much medical knowledge as these staff and these higher-ups in the fda and so they're willing to retire from the fda rather than be bullied by the administration so i kind of do want to applaud them for having a little bit of a backbone and wanting to do at least to some degree something a little bit right here Um, Mm. yeah just a political push to get kids under 12 get three jabs of the vaccine that still hasn't proven that it's gonna get rid of covid you know (laughs) I don't know what to say other than politics, politics, politics. <laughs> yeah, so that was our first um, news for this episode, the FDA mutiny here. It sounds like things are rumbling a little bit there. So the the two who left the FDA, there might be some rumblings of other people and some discussions. Maybe there might be some more who will put their foot down and say, we are not going to cave into this push here. So, second news item up for grabs here is um, all the the Afghanistan stuff that we've been hearing about, uh, the tragedy there. And I do want to say I haven't really been a fan of the war in Afghanistan in particular. I've been wanting um, to get the the troops home at some point, but there's a way to do this (laughs) correctly, you know. President Trump before wanted to end the war in Afghanistan, bring the troops home, and, you know, he didn't get that chance. So President Biden wanted to do that, and I think there's probably a lot of 
political motivation, you know, there's the timeline and especially given the wanting to have uh, basically a photo op on September 11th, the 20th anniversary of the September 11th attacks. And, and so he wanted to just remove the troops there. So basically had the troops coming home without removing the uh, citizens who were there and people in danger. And Biden seemed to, when asked about whether the Taliban was likely to take over when the troops were removed, he said, you know, he didn't believe that there was any chance of that happening. He thought the Afghan army was well equipped. And yeah, I think he should have known better. There were definite signals that the Taliban was ready to take over cabal (laughs) and yeah and he doesn't seem to want to take any responsibility for not withdrawing correctly and leaving hundreds of citizens in harm's way there yeah do you have any thoughts sweetheart before we get into the particular of this (laughs) yeah i think it is a sad situation that we witnessed here these last few weeks and just seeing all the war images and the attacks on these families and the attacks on Christians and Mm -hmm. just how much evil is still very much real there. And I think that sometimes we tend to forget about everything that goes on in other countries because we don't experience that same Mm -hmm. fear and threat here it's starting to become like that in some ways but I think that it was just a another way of showing us like the real oppression and just attacks that people have on the innocent and I don't know to me it was just a sad situation and you know that because of poor decisions that you know lives were lost and I think the story that you're going to share about is kind of a glimmer of light in this situation because it seemed like all right everything's going wrong they keep making poor decisions we have soldiers that are being killed and Mm. it just seemed kind of hopeless and then we get to read about the story you're going to share and it just kind of feels like oh okay there are still some Mm -hmm. good people and people that are willing to stand up for what's right and yeah so do you want to share that story oh yep sure so i was looking at an article by joseph trevithick on august 27th so not long after the Taliban quickly took over Cabal, the article is called Operation Pineapple Express saw special ops vets lead the rescue of hundreds of Afghans. No, the title there says a lot, but basically there were army vets or military vets, so people who were no longer in the military, but they used to be, even some older ones there. And so there is this uh, kind of voluntary special ops group called uh, Operation Pineapple Express. So it started off as a volunteer pineapple task force, so their mission was called Pineapple Express. The mission started where they were really targeted to try to rescue one particular Afghan man. But in the process of uh, rescuing him, it resulted in almost like an underground railroad type situation, kind of like uh, Harriet Tubman, yeah. um, you know, with the slaves there. But these were rescuing these uh, vets in this uh, Operation Pineapple Express. The Volunteer Pineapple Task Force were um, rescuing, actually in one night, basically, they rescued about 500 people at one time. And since that night, they've added about 130 or more than 130 people since then. And the term that's been used is shepherding people to the Hamad Karzai International Airport, the part that uh, is U.S. controlled there. And so a lot of these uh, people were operating on very little, if any, sleep, trudging through uh, basically sewers uh, to lead Afghans to safety, trying to keep it away from the Taliban who are looking to kill them. 
And what they would use, they would say the password pineapple to indicate these were people who were in danger and needed to be rescued. So someone would tell one of these military, uh, these vets, the word pineapple, or they show a picture of a pineapple on their phones kind of secretly to, to be led to safety there. I know there's more details if you look at the the article here that we'll have in the show notes. And I know the article wants to you know say that there were links between this volunteer force and the official military operations, but I think it was more of an informal allowance, you know. And as you said, sweetheart, it does show that there are good people <laughs> trying to do good things amid the the chaos and the ridiculous politics going on and. Of course, President Biden seems to refuse to take any kind of responsibility for the tragedies of, you know, the deaths of, uh, was it 12 or 13 service people, um, along with more civilians. ISIS detonated a bomb and... You know, and there's uh, the people killed in in the process, but President Biden just wants to stick to, you know, let's rejoice in ending this war. And like, yeah, I want the war ended, but you got to do it right. And you got to keep people (laughs) safe, you know, uh, remove the citizens first, you know, and as President Trump said, remove the citizens first and then the military leave last. You don't just take the military out and let the Taliban just wreak havoc on U.S. citizens who were there. (laughs) There's There's a good way to do it. And unfortunately, it resulted in these people having to be heroes. But yes, the Volunteer Pineapple Task Force are definitely the heroes of the day where the <laughs> those in political positions were not doing the right thing but it shows that there are people who are willing to risk their lives to do the right thing and risk their lives for the life and safety of these afghan people who were targeted by the taliban and so yes bravo to operation pineapple express <laughs> Christian Podcast Community is a cohesive group of like-minded podcasters proclaiming the truths of Christ with expertise and passion in the areas of theology, church history, Christian living, evangelism, apologetics, parenting, homeschooling, sermons, much, much more. So check us out at christianpodcastcommunity.org. One stop for all your favorite Christian podcasts. christianpodcastcommunity.org And now our third news item for this episode is the abortion restriction law that was just passed in May. Governor Greg Abbott of Texas signed it into law, and it went into effect on September 1st. So this was Senate Bill 8 that Greg Abbott signed into law. And so midnight morning of September 1st, it went into effect. So what was Senate Bill 8? It has the media in a frenzy right now and the abortion lobby acting like Armageddon's hitting right now. Well, this um, Senate Bill 8 basically bans all abortions for which a heartbeat or cardiac activity of a baby in the womb, a fetus, is detected. And so, you know, it's not an, a complete abortion ban, but effectually, you know, one of the so-called heartbeat bills. And what the media is in a frenzy about is the fact that effectually, in many cases, women don't know that they're pregnant until at least this point, if not later. So they say it's a near abortion ban in this case. 
And yeah, so abortion lobbyists try to get protection from this bill, uh, an emergency stay on the law. And the Supreme Court, in some ways, it was kind of like a technicality. They're basically saying, we don't see where they're standing right now to challenge the law as it is. (laughs) So... Yeah, I know that coming from this perspective of being 100% pro-life, we can criticize the bill, you know, for not being 100% against all abortions from conception. But it seems like it it could have some good effects the way it is right now, and it could prevent a lot of abortions. So I think there's a lot of positive there. What's interesting about this bill is that the way it was written was to try to avoid uh, legal challenges as much as possible. Like if it was like official state penalties, fines or imprisonments or whatever, that it could be challenged for constitutionality. But the way it was written is that it gets enforced by basically private citizens challenging or bringing lawsuits, basically, if they suspect that an abortion provider performed an abortion in violation of the law, or if someone was an accomplice, like, say, someone drove someone to an abortion clinic to get an abortion in violation of the law, then the one bringing the suit could win $10,000 if they are victorious in demonstrating that someone performed an abortion or was an enabler of an abortion. So you know, basically, it's it's trying to get around the legal challenges. And yeah, this particular aspect is pretty interesting. And it has a lot of the media up in arms about it because, the, you know, they're basically saying it's turning Texas citizens into uh bounty hunters in a way like they snitch on people or they might have even if they're not technically anti-abortion themselves like hey who wouldn't want to get ten thousand dollars so it's you know if they if they could find someone that's in violation of the law you know it'd be pretty interesting how this will actually turn out you know the uh, time it remains to be seen what's going to happen with this and I hope and pray that this turns out to be good, that it does protect lives and people won't abuse the way the law is. And hopefully, you know, abortion providers won't find all these loopholes to try to figure out how to do abortions in violation of the intent of the law. Mm -hmm. Do you have anything to say about this one, sweetheart? Oh, goodness. (laughs) Yeah. 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 I think um, this story is just one of those stories where there's a lot involved with it. And I think like you pointed out that it's definitely a huge step in preventing a lot of abortions from happening. But also there are a lot of ways to get around that as well. So Mm. it's kind of a yay, but (laughs) uh, (laughs) yeah. It's kind of like you want to be cautiously optimistic, but you can't just say victory. It remains to be seen, you know, because Mm -hmm. with the heartbeat aspect of it, you know, it's possible that there could be abortion providers who will try to manipulate the ultrasound, so on, things like that, and kind of not look or say find a way to not detect a heartbeat you know so we didn't find a heartbeat you know it must not be that point yet in its development or there was some kind of health issue with it and somehow it can warrant an abortion in this case you know and that's one of the problems with heartbeat bills you know Mm -hmm. that does seem to be a loophole because if it in any way depends on an abortion provider to be honest with detecting Detecting a heartbeat, you know, that may not be as enforceable as, you know, we may expect. But it seems like for the time being, there were fewer abortions in these first few days. But I'd say it still remains to be seen how things are going to fall in line and what kind of challenges they're going to be to it. Yeah. So some of the surrounding states are gearing up for an influx of -of out-of-state travelers to go get their abortions, like Kansas and Oklahoma and I know Colorado. 
they even said like they've seen an influx of abortions during the COVID-19 lockdown because Texas didn't allow abortions to happen during that time. And Colorado was one of the states that said abortion was a medical necessity and that they could remain open. So a lot of Texans came here to Colorado for that. Um, So yeah, I mean, they can travel to other states. I know I was reading a story about a woman who said that during COVID-19, her and her boyfriend lost their jobs and she found out she was pregnant. They didn't know what they were going to do having a baby at that time. And they were trying to figure out like where she could get an abortion since Texas was closed down and she found a place in New Mexico where they would actually pay for her plane ticket to go out there and pay for her abortion. Mm -hmm. So she was all excited about that. In the meantime, she found a provider in Dallas, Texas, that was the five hour drive for her. How it was able to do the abortion, which was closer, but they still paid for her travel to get there and paid for the procedure. And basically she was like, oh, I'm so thankful for how they just helped me plan out my life and, mm-hmm. you know, took care of me and my boyfriend. And that story just really mm-hmm. made me sad because <laughs> all the pro-life centers and doctors and providers There's so many resources to help people get on their feet and help them navigate this unexpected pregnancy and help them to still choose life and help them to... Okay, so now this poor girl, she has to deal with the effects of the abortion and who knows, most of the time the boyfriend leaves after the abortion so she may be on her own and she still may not have a job. With pro-life pregnancy centers, we provide so many resources, help them finish their education, help them find jobs, help them with baby care and equipment and help them uh, with relationships and parenting. Like there's so many ways to help them get on their feet and continue to grow and thrive. And so I feel like Planned Parenthood was just kind of like throwing a little bone at them and was like, oh, here, we'll pay for you and Mm -hmm. then we'll just send you on your way and not really do anything beyond that. And I don't know. To me, that was just kind of a sad story. And Mm -hmm. it gets worse. Yeah. So leading up to the heartbeat bill that was going to go into effect, there is a clinic that wanted to provide as many women as possible with abortions before the ban went into effect. And so this doctor worked 17 hours straight and performed over 67 surgical abortions. Mm -hmm. And they handed out over 60 abortion pills to women. So he had to do eight abortion procedures an hour. Whoa. And I have no idea how a doctor could do that. Like, how does he even have time to efficiently wash his hands in between each procedure or sterilize instruments or, hmm. like, make sure these women are recovering okay? There's so many parts that they're totally neglecting these women, and they're saying it's all in the name of helping these women. Hmm. And to me, it's just yeah. just so disheartening to hear stories like that where these doctors are just so intent on doing abortions and providing abortion services. Uh, another doctor was talking about how he's frustrated because he performs 20 to 30 abortions every day. And now with this new law, he'll be lucky if he can do maybe three abortions a day. <laughs> and it's like, are you serious? <laughs> like, yeah. you are upset that you cannot kill 20 to 30 babies a day? Mm. I don't get that at all. And mm. yeah, it just is such a heavy burden mm. for us. And I know, like, this topic is what God has really laid on my heart to help women and help babies. And I am so thankful for you and just how much support and love and encouragement and how you just kind of walk beside me and share in this desire that (laughs) to help women and babies and stuff because I just love that part about you. (laughs) (laughs) I'm so thankful for that. Oh, yeah. And thank you, sweetheart, for being able to talk about the stuff on our podcasts and 
truth espresso and i know it's definitely in, informative to a lot of listeners and you know eye opening and one good thing about this whole debacle then is that it seems like as you mentioned the numbers there it's now revealing things that maybe a lot of people didn't realize just how much you know how many abortions are done and how much some of these doctors like their livelihood is based on killing babies like it's you know assembly line like a factory type situation there and it's you know it's just ridiculous you know then for a doctor like that to mention that you know and complain about that that he can't do his 20 to 30 abortions a day i hope people reading that in a news article it opens their eyes and realize that was happening this is one doctor in one clinic you know i did, had no idea that it was just so pervasive and so much and i really hope it makes people realize just how gruesome the abortion industry is and you know and i think it's interesting too because i was looking this up again just to make sure but planned parenthood still has statistics you know on their little pie charts that say abortion only accounts for three percent of their <laughs> operations yeah. and like three percent Okay, when you're working nonstop 17, I mean, I know yeah. that was yeah. one exception, but how on earth do you have time to do all these other <laughs> counseling and STD testing and all these other services that they provide and the abortion only accounts for 3%? I don't know. It just... <laughs> It doesn't add up. And yeah, exactly. I think that with people being so upset with the Texas ban that more of the realistic side of it where we are seeing like, okay, there's a lot more abortions going on than they're saying or claiming. Yeah, so I think it's so like courageous and brave of mm. these people in Texas to stand up for this because they are under fire with Planned Parenthood and I mean even mm. Uber oh, yeah. is lending up for because they're <laughs> like, well, oh. we're not going to be sued if we drive someone to an abortion <laughs> clinic and <laughs> oh, it's just amazing like how this just definitely opened up Pandora's box. Down oh there, yeah. So. <laughs> I just before recording this, I saw an article where GoDaddy, the mm. the uh, website host, told Texas Right to Life that you need to find another web host provider in, in 24 hours because we're going to remove your site, you know. Yeah. Like, uh. It's just amazing how much people, like, to the extent mm. people are going after this. Yeah, it's like... Yeah, wow. because you can't kill babies, it's Armageddon, you know, yeah. and like, I know, unfortunately, because our culture has become so accustomed to this, to the practice as like, almost like a service that they rely on for maintaining a kind of lifestyle that it's going to pose a challenge for people if if it's more difficult for them to get abortions. You know, it's like, I hope and pray that God works through this to make enough people realize, yes, it is possible to live without depending on an abortion and killing a baby to solve your problems. You know, the, and there are, as you mentioned, sweetheart, there are plenty of pro-life organizations and crisis pregnancy centers that are more than willing to help they operate off of donations and volunteer service to help women who have the issue of like i'm help i'm pregnant i don't and i'm not ready i don't know what to do well we'll help you we'll provide you with you know whatever you need and we'll help you you know even with adoption if that's where you want to go but they'll help you with anything you need other than killing the baby and so there are options you know to help in crisis pregnancy situations that don't involve the calloused quick fix uh, solution of kill the baby and move on and i think to me it was Another interesting thing I found looking at some of Planned Parenthood statistics 
was that they uh, claim that their revenue is $68 million <laughs> a year. Like, I mean, between donations through their 501c3 and mm. they is get that, all sorts of funding. Does that include federal funding from taxpayers? <laughs> Not that I saw. Okay. So, yeah, it's yeah. probably even more. Yeah, because Planned because Parenthood is one of those unique institutions that they get to run as a profit-making business and getting taxpayer funding, you know. That's a lot of money. Yeah. <laughs> and what are they doing to mm. help women with mm. that money besides just killing their babies and making more money? Mm. Because the abortion side of it is the most profitable yeah. part of Planned Parenthood. And a huge portion of their revenue that I saw, like, spending was on programs. <laughs> okay, what kind of programs are they offering yeah. that would be costing the majority of their revenue? <laughs> um, it's yeah. just, like, frustrating, but it just reminds you a lot of different situations in the Bible. I think that, mm. okay, all these different pregnancy centers and even our clinic, it's like, Okay, they're not profitable or they totally run off of, you know, donations and yet they're helping women and families and children for like the rest of our life. I mean, it's a lifetime investment that some of these pro-life centers are offering and yet they can't even claim a million dollars in revenue. So I, I don't know, to me it's just interesting like Okay, even though a lot of the pro-life people have very little, they give so much and hmm. offer so much to help. And yeah. I just think it's really amazing. I'm guessing some of those programs uh, might have to do with campaign contributions. You know, if I had to guess, you know, getting politicians to do their bidding. But <laughs> yeah. You're probably hmm. right. But yeah, so it seems like the underlying theme of all three of our articles... Uh, which, you know, you mentioned, sweetheart, you told me this is what you see, the underlying thread, is being courageous. So with the FDA mutiny, we had two courageous higher-up staff people leave the FDA because they didn't want to be pressured politically to approve vaccine booster shots that weren't properly tested for kids under 12. <laughs> And we have the courageous special ops, the Operation Pineapple Express, courageously risking their lives to save hundreds of Afghans who are targeted by the Taliban to the airport there. And then we have those who are courageous in standing up for life in Texas and upholding the ban against abortion you know, as imperfect as it is, but standing up for life and even as the pushback and, you know, reading the news, it's an intense pushback. I mean, you think the world's going to blow up, you know, you think <laughs> it's World War Three going on here and, you know, the abortion lobby don't want to lose their money killing people and they're going to fight tooth and nail and slander, do whatever they can so those who are standing up against that are being courageous. So I think we have some verses about being courageous for the truth. Joshua 1, seven, where Joshua is told, Only be thou strong and very courageous that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law, which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. So Joshua is going to be courageous to stand up for the truth of God's law here. And then, sweetheart, you gave me Esther 4.14, where Esther is told... And who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? And so I believe that was her cousin Mordecai telling her in the situation she was in, being married to the king of Hazareus, and that basically God put you in this situation where, you know, you might be used to save your people. And so, yeah, whatever situation we're in, and we want to thank those who were willing to stand strong and be courageous against the slings and arrows of the politics of this world that fights against God's truth. So, hope you enjoyed this uh, episode of Truth Espresso, talking about these three news articles and being courageous, and stay tuned for the next episode of Truth Espresso. <music> Thank you.
Thank you for waking up with Truth Espresso. Good morning and God bless your day. Hey friends, Daniel Minnick here again. If you liked waking up to this episode of Truth Espresso, I would really appreciate it if you would rate it on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or whatever application you use to listen to Truth Espresso.